Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Munson Healthcare's COVID-19 press conference. My name is Diane Mihalik. I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Munson Healthcare, and I'll be your host today. Today is Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. Joining us as speakers today will be Dr. Christine Nefsi, Chief Medical Officer for Munson Healthcare, Wendy Hershenberger, the Health Officer for the Grand Traverse County Health Department, Lisa Peacock, the Health Officer for the Benzie Lelanau District Health Department and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan, and Dr. Jennifer Morse, the Medical Director of District Health Department number 10. We will have one Q&A session at the end of today's presentations. If you are a reporter joining us on Zoom, please submit your question through the Q&A feature. And if you're joining us live on Facebook, uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, you can submit your questions through Facebook as you think of them, and we will get to as many questions as possible within our 45 minute time period today. So now to get us started uh, with an overview of Munson Healthcare's current uh, numbers and status, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christine Nefsi, Chief Medical Officer for Munson Healthcare. Welcome, Dr. Nefsi. Thanks, Diane. All right, so let's start out with our Michigan numbers. Um, I won't reiterate our cumulative data. You can see that there, um, but you can look down at that bottom box and see that for the state of Michigan, we are at a 12% positivity rate, which is uh, really a very nice trend line down. We're excited to see that. We'll move to the next slide. You can see that we regionally are following uh, the the state's trend, we are still at a 17.2% positivity. Again, a nice trend line down, um, although still relatively high. That was about where we were when we made the decision to move to pandemic level red. Um, so as you recall, below 20% is when we make that move. So um, again, we are at 17.2, a nice trend line down, and certainly the direction we would like to be going. Next slide. And there you can see our uh, inpatient cases. Um, again, that long plateau we had uh, after that last surge, and then just recently uh, a nice downward trend, uh, I believe a reflection of our positivity rate going down as well. Next slide. Here are our numbers as of this morning. So you can see we have 50 patients hospitalized across the Munson healthcare system with COVID-19. Uh, 15 of them are vaccinated, four are boosted. Uh, 10 patients in our ICU, one vaccinated, none boosted, and then same uh, one vaccinated, none boosted of our four patients that are on a ventilator. So um, again, a, a good demonstration of the impact of protection that being vaccinated and boosted can provide. Next slide. We continue to track uh, some sporadic cases of influenza. Um, so still around and circulating, uh, but certainly not anywhere uh, near um, an alarming number, uh, but something that we continue to follow. Next slide. And again, uh, you know, our treatment options for COVID-19 remain limited. We still continue to have a very low limited supply of monoclonal antibody um, and still some supply chain issues with the uh, oral antivirals. So again, um, to avoid COVID-19 and certainly to avoid hospitalization and serious illness, vaccination is still your best option. And then lastly, we presented last week our new Voices for Vaccination uh, Regional Art Contest. Um, so uh, just a reminder that that is open through March 15th. There are a number of categories as well as prizes and the ability to have your art on display. Um, so in any medium, if you have a message to send about what vaccines mean to you or how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted you, um, how uh, vaccines have either improved your lives or the lives of people around you in your community, please let us know and participate. Great, thanks Dr. Nefsi, appreciate the updates. And uh, again, excited to see our numbers continuing to trend in the right direction. Uh, we'll have you back uh, in a moment for the Q&A session. Uh, but next I'd like to get to some of our health department updates and we'll begin with Wendy Hershenberger, the health officer for the Grand Traverse County Health Department. Welcome back, Wendy, and uh, looking forward to your update. 
All right, good morning. Uh, so we will start out with uh, trends for Grand Traverse County. So Feb the month of February uh, really has shown a sharp downward trend overall in our positive cases, our percent positivity, uh, the demand for testing, uh, quite a decrease in deaths. Uh, so, so those are things we all look at as uh, metrics that are indicators. Um, and we know that the home antigen testing is really filling an important gap in the accessibility to uh, other types of rapid testing. And so we also know that as a result of that, that we might not have all the positive cases being reported, um, but we really still can look at these numbers uh, as overall um, metrics and trends. So for Grand Traverse County, as of uh, last Friday, we were reporting 30 cases a day for the previous week. We had one death. Uh, as of this morning, we're down to 13.3% positivity. It dropped a couple percentages over the weekend. And as Dr. Nefsi pointed out, we've seen a decrease in the hospitalizations. Um, with the increase to vaccines, testing, and treatment, uh, we anticipate soon we'll be entering kind of a post-surge recovery phase. Um, we don't predict any immediate uh, resurgent. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a bit hard to tell, um, but local and state health departments will continue to monitor those conditions and, and the metrics that could lead to those future uh, surges. Next slide, please. As part of that, uh, we do have a lot of tools now that we did not have access to, say, even a, a year ago. So we have uh, vaccines that are very proven to protect against severe outcomes and death. We have uh, more available testing, both the rapid antigen and PCR tests. We also know now through some studies that have been out recently that masks do protect the individual wearer of those from uh, testing positive and getting disease and transmitting it. Uh, we also know from the past that social distancing and ventilation are also good ways to decrease your chance of getting COVID. And then we also do have treatments and certainly hope that those treatments continue to evolve and continue to expand as far as availability. So with all this, local health departments will continue to offer as many of these tools as we can. So that's through vaccination clinics, testing, distributing uh, CAN95 masks when the supply allows. And we will also continue to communicate the current risk for people. So individuals are really encouraged to assess their own risk levels and utilize these mitigation tools that are available to them to help keep themselves and their loved ones safe. Next slide. This slide should help with understanding uh, your personal and your household risk. Uh, it's, it's important that when you're making decisions that you're uh, considering the setting that you might be in uh, how populated the, how many people will be there and your vaccination status, as well as the current level of community transmission. And then the personal and family risk factors. So if you've got someone in your household who's high risk, then uh, hopefully people around them are making choices to help protect them too. So this chart really looks at on the left-hand side, it's whether or not you're vac vaccinated and, and fully boosted or not, and whether or not you have individual risk factors and it's measured against um, the different kinds of settings. And so the darker the blue, the higher the risk. All right, next slide, please. Uh, this is just information for our Grand Traverse County um, KN95 mask. We're currently giving away adult uh, masks. Uh, we did have an event scheduled for today, but it had to be, it'll be rescheduled just due to the weather. Uh, we have distributed over 53,000 masks uh, over the course of two, just two one day uh, giveaways. So uh, we're definitely seeing the demand. And we also um, are trying to get some child size CAN95 masks from the state as well for future, but don't, don't have an estimated delivery date on those yet. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just information on our vaccination and booster clinic. It is at the, the Cherryland Mall where we've been for quite some time. Our normal cadence is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday. We did have to uh, cancel today due to the weather. Um, and it's uh, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. and then closed from noon to one so the staff can have lunch. Um, but those are just walk-ins only now. 
uh, no need for an appointment, and we will uh, maintain that as long as there is demand in the community. Next slide, please. And then lastly, our curbside COVID testing. This is by appointment only, so there is a link at the bottom in blue. Uh, if you go to our website, there's an easy link for testing as well. Um, so you do have to have an appointment and appointments are rolled out. There's almost always availability right now. Um, so just please bring your ID and uh, the, the clinical staff will determine whether or not you need a rapid test or a PCR or potentially both. And, um, and then you'll get your results. So those are our offerings right now. Thank slide. you. Thanks so much, Wendy. Appreciate the updates. Thank you again for everything your team is doing. We'll have you back uh, in a moment for the Q&A session, but now I'd like to welcome back Lisa Peacock, the health officer for the Benzie Lilina District Health Department and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. Welcome back, Lisa. Thanks, Diane, thanks for having me. So in keeping with what both Wendy and Dr. Nefsi have talked about, um, we are you know, welcoming some long awaited changes over the past few weeks, um, certainly agree with everything they've said about cases positivity and everything going down um, pretty rapidly. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that can be said is that the surges that we've had, including the recent Omicron surge, have um, taught us a lot about what we can anticipate in the future. Um, and, you know, it, although each surge has been a little different, each um, variant has been a little different, there are some things that have been consistent. And so I think, you know, both the predictability um, that we're gaining as our knowledge evolves around COVID-19 um, is helpful. It is also helpful that we now have tools um, in our toolbox that we haven't had before that can lead us to some of the changes that you're hearing about, um, you know, widespread availability of vaccination for people to be able to vaccinate themselves and all, you know, school-age children of all ages. Um, we know a lot about the effectiveness of boosters and the, the need for boosters, especially with the most recent variant. Um, and then we have access to more individual tools that we can use to keep ourselves safe, including masks that are better at protecting the wearer, like Wendy mentioned. Um, and you know, access to therapeutics that um, we hope increase soon, but certainly for the most vulnerable people, there is hope on the horizon that um, you know, COVID infections can be treated early and um, help in preventing severe disease and um, outcomes. So hence the changes that you've seen in um, masking both mandates, requirements, and advisories over the past couple of weeks. So last week, MDHHS updated its mask guidance. Um, it's pretty comprehensive and it's linked in our PowerPoint um, to reflect that Michigan is entering a different time, um, a kind of post-surge recovery phase. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, my health departments, the Health Department in Northwest Michigan and the Benzie Leelana District Health Department also rescinded our first amended order, which required masks to be worn in school settings. And that was effective last Thursday at the end of the day. Um, and all of this, you know, kind of leads people to the question about what makes now different than before. And, and I think, um, you know, what I've talked about so far is, is all part of that, um, the sustained decreasing risk trends, which we really haven't seen since mid-August. Um, so that's, you know, a wonderful welcome change. Um, and then just the knowledge and the predictability of the patterns of the virus allow us to kind of look at pandemic response in these different phases. And then again, as I said, more tools available to individuals so that they can protect themselves. A way different time from back when we didn't have vaccinations and only cloth masks. Um, so we have, to, we have to be able to evolve as, as the situation evolves. We still recommend continued layered mitigation strategies and really to be sensitive to people who are vulnerable. Um, there are children in school who are vulnerable. There are vulnerable family members at home and so really, um, you know, making sure that the, those families have the tools and knowledge that they need to be able to protect themselves, but each of us also taking that responsibility to understand who around us might be vulnerable and how can we protect them as well. Um, one of the best things we can do to protect everyone is to get our vaccination and complete that series, including a booster if you haven't had it yet. Um, and then also understanding what to do if you test positive for COVID. Um, to how to isolate, um, how to quarantine, how to wear that mask for the second five days of isolation. So um, lots of us are giving out free KN95 masks. We are anticipating soon having more KN95 masks available for children 
And so, um, you know, please visit our websites for all of that information. All of the health departments have those websites updated with links where you can find free masks, where you can find a, a vaccination appointment or a place to be tested. You can go to the next slide, Diane. So um, MDHHS put out this graphic, which I think is really helpful in looking at just our cycle of COVID-19. And we're learning to look at this in a cycle, which is great. At the top is our, you know, the response um, to a surge. So this is when, you know, this is where we currently were or recently were during the Omicron surge, meaning that we needed a rapid response to reduce community transmission as much as we could, meaning we up the availability of testing, masking, medications, we make sure that vaccination appointments are available. Um, we do things like mask in, in um, public settings, indoors, um, make sure that we're distancing at work and at school and that kind of thing so that we can try to reduce transmission as much as possible so that we protect the healthcare system, protect the vulnerable of, uh, among us and keep vital infrastructure functioning like school and government and the economy. And then if we go down to the right, you see the recovery post surge stage. That's where we are right now. So, um, you know, we expect to see this stage. This is wonderful that we're in this stage and we expect to see that happen for longer periods of time as COVID evolves. We're better at recognizing when we are post-surge and, um, you know, getting into some different conditions that are a little easier to live with. Um, this is the time that we kind of strengthen community support. This is the time that we're trying to really empower community members to make the best choices for their own individual situations. As that community transmission goes down, it is more important for individuals to make those decisions themselves and protect themselves and their families. And then, you know, as we have seen over the past couple of years, there are times when we expect COVID to ramp back up. Um, certainly in the fall when, you know, just before school starts, we can, we can anticipate that that might be a time that we need to layer on some more mitigation measures. So if it's due to a new variant that we've heard about or a local outbreak or we have seasonal changes, this is the time when we're getting ready, um, educating the public, making sure everybody has access to the supplies that they need, their masks, their vaccination appointments and things like that. Just like we get ready for school in other ways, we can get ready for school in this way as well. So um, as we move through this cycle together, it's, it's just important to understand that, that we know more now, we have more tools in our toolbox and we're able to kind of enjoy this recovery post-surge time. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate the update. That's all encouraging news. Um, we will also have you back uh, after uh, Dr. Morse has a chance uh, to provide her update. So next, uh, I'd like to welcome back uh, Dr. Jennifer Morse, the Medical Director for District Health Department Number 10. Welcome back, Dr. Morse. Hi, thanks for having me. So as the others mentioned, our cases continue to decrease as well. Um, our average, or sorry, our total cases <clears throat> for the prior week have gone down almost by half. So our average cases per day total, uh, we're just over about 100. I found out today that our average case per day for the past seven days um, was just over 60. So again, another decrease over the past week. And our percent positivity in cases per million have also continued to decrease um, as everyone else has been seeing as well. Um, I do mention though that our case counts do still continue to be high compared to where we'd like to see them. So again, I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, you know, masking an individual choice, but still we're about 10 times higher than we'd like to see when we start talking about stopping mask use in public settings for personal protection. Um, so, you know, again, as you make those decisions, just keep in mind that the overall case rates are still relatively high um, when making those decisions about, um, you know, personal protection. So just things are much better than they were, but still pretty high. So next slide. <clears throat> Uh, we do continue with our community testing sites. Um, the percent positivities here are cumulative totals. Um, our number of individuals presenting for testing have dropped quite dramatically. Again, as cases start to drop, in order to prevent another surge, it becomes more and more important to identify people who do have COVID so that they can isolate and close contacts can quarantine so that we don't have another surge. So 
Um, when people have symptoms of COVID, I really do encourage you to get tested and to make sure and stay home so that we don't have another surge and so that you can um, you know, take care of yourself and your family appropriately. So just a reminder that those sites are still there and still available to you um, should you need them. And um, you know there are home tests available still through the federal government. So to take advantage of those uh, as well. Next slide. <clears throat> Our vaccination rates are pretty stable. We still do have pockets that have lower rates. And you know, if you do live in some of those areas, um, again, keep those things in mind as you're making decisions about masking in public and um, you know, making sure you as an individual take precautions to protect yourself and your family. Next slide. So our five through 11 year old vaccination rates has continued to increase slightly. Uh, we're still below the state average. Um, so again, if you have children in those age groups, um, you know, as we see declining in masking in the schools and other settings, um, you know, there's one more thing you can do to help protect your children and your family members. Um, all of our links are still the same. You can find uh, our pop-up clinics and our vaccination clinics on our websites. And um, we also have a question line that you can email and call that's available on our website as well. And um, you know, they're still staffing that line. So should you have any questions or concerns, you can contact us through that resource as well. So uh, we do have the KN95 masks and all of those things. So again, I know we're very happy that things are decreasing, but um, we want to keep that trend going. And, um, you know, just want to make sure everyone continues to be vigilant and aware of, of the situation. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Um, and thank you for those important reminders about uh, continuing to do our part uh, so we don't have another surge. That was the end of our panelist presentation. So now I'd like to invite all of our speakers um, back to turn on their video and audio, and we will begin our Q&A session. We do have um, a few questions that have already uh, come in. And I will start with uh, a question for Dr. Morse. This is uh, specific to your jurisdiction. And the question reads, in the Ludington Schools statement regarding elimination of the mask requirement, they stated, that MDHHS is no longer recommending masking in schools. Is that accurate? So, um, you know, I've not seen that document. I have had other schools and other districts say something similar. Um, you know, the document put out by MDHHS, I think was a little confusing. It did state um, that it should be made with consultation with your local health department. Um, so I, I think that document again um, was a bit long and confusing. Um, the current recommendations, again, based on the levels that we're still seeing and the CDC recommendations, it is still recommended that universal masking continue within the schools. Um, we have heard that the CDC will be providing some new guidance on, on masking this week. I don't know when that might be out or if it will end up being this week uh, for sure, um, but it is still recommended that um, universal masking continue in the schools. Um, and again, the CDC currently still does recommend universal masking in all public settings um, until we get down to the low um, to mild or moderate, I can, the, the lower two levels of uh, transmission rates. And you know, I'll defer if, if my other health department colleagues have any other thoughts or, or recommendations uh, for schools that might differ from my own. Nope, doesn't sound like it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, the next question is uh, for Lisa Peacock. And the question is, is Charlevoix County still in a high community transmission area? And where can people possibly find that information? Um, they can find that information pretty easily on the, um, either go to the coronavirus, uh, michigan.gov slash coronavirus, or the go right to the My Safe Start map which you can Google and find that very easily to look at the transmission level by county. Um, that is also linked on the michigan.gov website. So those are two great areas. Yes, um, most of the areas of Michigan are still in, at least the last time I checked, um, we're still in the high transmission levels. So that was a couple of days ago, but, um, but yep. Great, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Dr. Nefsi, this next question is for you. With case positivity rates below 20%, should we expect to see Munson Healthcare downgrade from pandemic level red in the next couple of days? Yes, that would be my hope and desire. And I can confirm that we are just uh, finalizing some uh, operational uh, concerns and uh, we will get information out to the public as soon as we are able to uh, make those changes. So stay tuned. Um, next question I will ask of uh, Wendy. The question is, I've read that there is a new COVID-19 variant, BA2. Um, do, are we currently seeing this in uh, Grand Traverse County yet? Uh, no, not not yet. Um, you know, the, those are um, when you start to see, maybe when we start to see another surge, that might be an indication that we have a new variant. Uh, usually the variants are detected in lower Michigan uh, before they are in, in northern Michigan. And again, that would be through some of the specific uh, testing that's done with the state lab. Uh, they do a random sample of, I think, 10 percent of all the tests that are run. So uh, we'll continue to watch for that, but definitely have not been alerted uh, of any anything even statewide yet on that. Great, thanks, Wendy. And on a related note, um, this question is for Dr. Nefsi. Um, I've read that the new BA2 variant does not respond to any of the um, antibody treatments. Is that true? Um, not entirely. So uh, I, I think if you'll recall, we have really adjusted uh, the different monoclonal antibody types to the variant that we're seeing. So most recently, we uh, switched to zatrovimab. There is a new one, bebtilovimab, that is coming out that is um, supposedly effective against Omicron and the new variant. Um, but that is one of those things that uh, keeps, keeps changing and that we keep on top of. Um, and again, Part of the reason why we keep stressing that those treatments, not only uh, uh, from a supply chain perspective, um, are a bit tenuous, but um, you know, just uh, getting it out there um, for, for people can be logistically difficult as well, and especially when we have to change and adjust the supply chain and uh, where we're getting it from. So again, can't stress enough uh, the importance of being vaccinated as your best uh, option highly available, um, readily available, very safe um, and cheap. So, um, you know, if, if you're going to look at how to best address um, and protect yourself, vaccine would be at the top of the list. Thanks, Dr. Nefsi. On that note, um, I will ask Lisa Peacock to address this next question. And it's a general question about when should we look at getting the next booster? Is there an age range or how long after the first booster? Um, well, so if any of my colleagues have more information than I do about that, I, I please feel free to jump in. I think that we don't know yet. You know, I, I think that part of the part of the normal process when we are monitoring vaccinations after they've been um, given for the first time and produced and been through clinical trials, the next stage is monitoring the population who's had them and um, looking at how long that immunity lasts. And that's what led us to the need you know, for a booster now is waning immunity after a certain period of time. That's what led us to an additional dose for people who are immunocompromised is understanding that they need more of the vaccination to complete their primary series and get enough of a robust immune response. And so I anticipate that as time goes on, we'll, we will learn more, but I don't have any um, certainty as to when that will be at this point. Great, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Next question is for Dr. Nefsi. Um, this person states, I need to um, have some blood drawn. I don't want to exchange a well-fitting N95 mask for a surgical mask that might not fit as well. Am I going to be able to keep my ma mask on for that? Please explain the mask, current mask policy at the hospital. Um, so I'd be happy to. And let me just start by saying, I think one of the things that we've learned during this pandemic is um, that sometimes uh, opportunities exist for um, people to um, intervene that maybe don't have the uh, best interest of the community at heart. So what we've seen with these supply chain issues is that there are people um, putting products out there that are substandard. Um, you know, they don't work, uh, they just aren't, they don't meet the medical uh, quality that we would 
um, demand for our hospital staff. So we don't know when guests come to our um, facilities where they got the mask from. We have no way of uh, you know, determining, oh, they got that from the health department or they got that from a, a good source. So because we can do that for the masks that we provide, we do uh, insist that everybody that comes in put on a surgical mask. So if you have a well-fitted uh, N95 or KN95 that you want to wear, what we would just say is please put our surgical mask over top of that mask that you have. So we wouldn't necessarily make you remove it, but we would insist that you wear our mask. And that's only because we have no way of verifying the quality or effectiveness of the current mask you have. Thank you, Dr. Nafsi. Um, next question, Dr. Nefsi, as is uh, related to our pandemic level. If uh, Munson Healthcare is moving out of level red soon, what pandemic level do you suspect we will be in? Well, um, below red is orange, so that's what we will be moving to. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, if we continue to see this trend, we don't see. Um, the a surge secondary to that new variant that's uh, going around, which we're hopeful we won't, we would move from orange to yellow. And we are really trying to use objective metrics in doing that. Um, our, our percent positivity, our cases per 100,000, um, the percentage of patients we have in the hospitals that are uh, COVID patients, um, our staffing impact, all of those kinds of things as we continue to move. So orange is the next level. Great, thank you. That's it for our questions today. Um, sounds like um, in addition to us trending in the right direction, so are the number of questions we're getting, not as, uh, not as many this week. So I wanna thank all of our speakers, um, be able to give you some uh, time back today because I know you're all busy doing all the other great work uh, that you mentioned today. So I wanna thank Dr. Nefsi, uh, Dr. Morse, Wendy Hershenberger, and Lisa Peacock for joining us today. Um, and last week I said I wasn't sure when uh, the next press conference would be, but, um, and we do have a question coming in about that. Um, we are hopefully going to move to an every other week um, as needed press conference schedule. So um, in a couple of weeks, uh, please look for an announcement on whether or not we're going to have one. And again, it'll be based on what's happening in the community, um, the number of updates that the health departments have um, and uh, additional information we need to communicate. So again, appreciate everyone tuning in regularly uh, for these updates. Um, while we're not on these press conferences, there's a ton of community resources that are available to you. Again, all of the local health department resources and websites are listed on the MunsonHealthcare.org website, in addition to vaccines.gov and 211 Michigan. And again, the Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Michigan is another great resource. Next slide, please. Uh, the health departments all mentioned uh, their individual testing resources that they have available. Uh, we also want to remind everyone the important, continue to remind everyone of the importance of testing if you are symptomatic. Um, you can check with your primary care provider, retail pharmacies. Um, there's a great website uh, to find a testing location at michigan.gov forward slash coronavirus. There's a Michigan COVID-19 hotline. And then as always, the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line is still available at 231-935-0951. And just a, another reminder that uh, the federal government is still making uh, at-home COVID tests available and you can order those uh, for you and a few members of your family for free and get those mail delivered directly to you. So you'll have them on hand uh, when you need them. Next slide, please. And as always, I just want to uh, remind everyone uh, for the uh, following us on social media, signing up for our newsletter. Um, and again, visit us at MunsonHealthcare.org for the latest updates. Um, and just a reminder that the Ask a Nurse line, if you have COVID-19 questions or vaccine related questions, booster questions, you can call the Ask a Nurse line, but you can also use that line for general health questions that you have that are non-COVID-19 related. So again, thank you everyone for your participation today and we will hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Have a great day.